Come gather around people wherever you roam and admit that the waters around you have grown and accept it that soon you'll be drenched to the bone. If your time to you is worth saving, then you better start swimming or you'll sink like a stone. For the times, they are a-changing. The times, they are a-changing. These words from Bob Dylan were iconic for a generation. They led many of his contemporaries to name him the voice of a generation, to which he had a few choice words about where they should put their phrase. He didn't want to be a voice, he just was one. These words had honesty to them. They were a fair, blunt, honest assessment of 1963 America. And 56 years later, we still hear relevance in these words. For the times, they are changing. Through music, through poetry, we have many of the most powerful expressions of the soul that we have read and heard naming the hurts and sorrows of people, naming the hopes and potentials that we all hold for change. Throughout time, music and poetry have given us powerful expressions of the soul. And today's scripture highlights one of those timeless expressions. Isaiah, in Isaiah 61, writes to the Hebrew people in the midst of great suffering, words that Jesus draws from in the text today. Isaiah's original words were these. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. God has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them garland instead of ashes, oil of gladness instead of mourning, a mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display God's glory. They shall bring up the ancient ruins. They shall rebuild the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastation of many generations. To people who had fallen to foreign invaders, who were divided by exile, Isaiah's words are naming their hurts. They're brokenhearted, they're captives, they're prisoners, they're mourning, they have a faint spirit. But he's also naming their hope. Liberty, release, comfort, praise, a lasting strength. And about 600 years later, Jesus picks up the same words that Isaiah used, draws them back up and shares them in his home church, his home synagogue, to a people who have experienced in their lifetime or in their parents' life a failed revolution, a counting and a taxing by Rome that has left them even more impoverished than they were. It has left them as a people who held little power and faced challenges of disease, poverty, isolation. Jesus is naming their hurts. Jesus is naming their hurts through the poetry of Isaiah. Except Jesus is also telling them he intends to be part of the change. He's not just naming the hurt. He says, and I will be a prophetic voice to make things better. He's going to do his part for the revolution to change things for good. Now, everyone likes change that they choose. Everyone likes change on their terms. But sometimes, sometimes we will sit in injustice rather than rock the boat. Sometimes, sometimes we will sit in it. We will tolerate it. We'll even rationalize how we profit from the status quo, even when we feel like we're the one being oppressed. Sometimes we are so overwhelmed by the enormity of needs around us, of injustices, that we prefer naivety, even denial, to the truth, to the hard truth of injustice. So when Jesus steps up and dares to name the problems, when Jesus steps up and dares to suggest that he'll be part of a solution, that he's going to address them, well, they all lost their ever-loving minds. 
He's going to tell them when the change is coming. He's going to tell them what's going on. Joseph's kid dares to have a voice in all of this. Just some poor kid from down the block. Who's he to tell them it's time to change their lives around? They want to throw him off a cliff. They went from appreciating the words he said to throw him off the cliff. What were they afraid of? Why were they so afraid of change? Were they afraid? Were they afraid that Rome would strike back if they were part of a political revolution? Were they afraid of the political revolution? Were they afraid if this was going to be some sort of societal upheaval within the Jewish community? Were they afraid of the Pharisees and the Sadducees if it was going to be some sort of societal, cultural revolution? Were they afraid for themselves if it was going to be a spiritual revolution? Were they afraid they were going to be asked to change? Not just the oppressors, not just those who were impacting them. Were they going to have to change if Jesus' revolution, his prophetic movement, was going to change them? What were they afraid of? Were they afraid of changing neighborhoods? Were they afraid of a revolution? Were they afraid of changing schools, of changing churches? What about us? Are we afraid of a revolution in our midst? Are we afraid of poor people raising up and claiming dignity? Are we afraid of ethnicities rising up to claim their dignity and their humanity? Are we afraid of identities proclaiming their equality? Are we afraid of a revolution in our midst? Are we afraid of our neighborhoods changing, our schools changing, our churches changing? Are we afraid of a revolution? Or are we the ones crying out for it? Or maybe it's both. Maybe it's both. You may be familiar with the anthem from Selma, the movie, written by Common and John Legend, Glory. Maybe we both want a revolution and are afraid of it. Hear these words. Hands to the heavens, no man, no weapon, formed against, yes, glory is destined. Every day, women and men become legends. Sins that go against our skin become blessings. The movement is a rhythm to us. Freedom is like a religion to us. Justice is juxtapositioning us. Justice is juxtapositioning us. Setting one against another. Irony, opposites, tension, juxtapositioning us. Maybe it's true for us. Maybe we are ready for a revolution and we fear it at the same time. Maybe we are the ones praying for change and avoiding change all at the same time. Maybe it's because we know that to make change, first we have to follow the path of the prophets, follow the path of the poets and the dreamers and name our truth. Maybe we know that before we can bring change, we have to speak bluntly about the truth of the world we live in. And the truth is, change is not always something we want. What leads you to keep things the way they are? What leads you to keep things the way they are? What keeps you from fanning the fires of revolution and change? The truth is, change is not always something we want. So what are your reasons? Privilege? Power? Respect? Tradition? Nostalgia? Fear of making things worse? Maybe it's a sense of duty. If we can name that fear, if we can name those things that anchor us to injustice, if we can name what anchors us to injustice, then at least we can compare. We can talk about the risks and the rewards, the cost of change versus the cost of injustice, the cost of doing nothing. Before Jesus stepped up to read these words we heard today, before he stood before his family and friends in Nazareth, he had been in the wilderness. He had been in the wilderness being tempted, facing his own issues. He had to go away to reflect. Then he could come back. After facing his truths, then he could come back and be ready to be an agent of change. Once he faced his truths, the reality, 
then he could come be an agent of change. We know that King, Chavez, Huerta, and many others had to go face themselves in the mirror. And once they did, then they were ready. Then they were ready to proclaim truth to themselves, to their community, to those in power, to everyone. Sometimes that truth comes across in words of inspiration that echo through generations and linger with us. Words from the poets and the dreamers. I have a dream. Si se puede. We will never forget. Sometimes truth comes across in beautiful poetic ways. And other times it is more of a blunt truth that hits us in the head, stabs us in the heart, and pierces our own soul too. For example, Marvin Gaye's Inner City Blues. Rockets? Moonshots? Spend it on the have-nots. Money, we make it. Before we see it, you take it. The way they do my life made me want to holler. The way they do my life. This ain't living. This ain't living. No, no, baby, this ain't living. Or Leonard Cohen, that many of you know for his song, Alleluia, writes these words in another well-known piece called Everybody Knows. He released it in 1975, Concrete Blonde sang it again in 1990, and Sigra just did it again in 2016, Everybody Knows. Everybody knows the dice are loaded. Everybody rolls with their fingers crossed. Everybody knows the war is over. Everybody knows the good guys lost. Everybody knows the fight was fixed. The poor stay poor and the rich get rich. That's how it goes, and everybody knows. Maybe... The most powerful song of blunt truth I've heard is Nina Simone's. Her response to Medgar Evers' murder in the 16th Street church bombing in 1963. Simone sings these words. This is a show tune, but the show hasn't been written for it yet. Hound dogs on my trail, school children sitting in jail, black cat crosses my path, I think every day is going to be my last. Lord, have mercy on this land of mine. We're all going to get it in due time. I don't belong here. I don't belong there. I've even stopped believing in prayer. Don't tell me. I'll tell you. Me and my people are just about due. I've been there, so I know. And they keep saying, go slow. Alabama's gotten me so upset. Tennessee's made me lose my rest. And everybody knows about Mississippi. God damn. Excuse the blasphemy, but in the face of discrimination, it's understandable and even appropriate. Excuse the language, but in the shadow of slavery and the hypocrisy of her day, don't we imagine that God agrees? Don't we imagine God hearing her sing her pain? Mississippi, God damn, and God saying, Amen, I agree. I'm with you, and I do. It's an injustice that cannot stand. And in her pain, in her tears, we see the power of proclaiming our hurts, the power of preaching our truth to one another. We see the change, revolution, starts with an honesty that comes up from the heart, naming our problems, proclaiming our hurts and our sorrows, so that then, then, we can proclaim our hope for the future. Proclaiming God at work in our world, and even through us. What are our hopes? What are our visions for the future? What needs to be set free? What needs to see light? Where can we proclaim the year of the Lord's love, the year of God's favor for all people? Where do we have to do the hard work for change? The poets and the dreamers have often some of their words and melodies of inspiration. From Hamilton, we get these words. I may not live to see our glory, but I will gladly join the fight. And when our children tell the story, they'll tell the story of tonight. So raise a glass to freedom, something they can never take away. No matter what they tell you, raise a glass to the four of us. Tomorrow there will be more of us telling the story of tonight. Peter, Paul, and Mary said it this way. 
Well, I've got a hammer and I've got a bell and I've got a song to sing all over this land. It's the hammer of justice. It's the bell of freedom. It's a song about the love between my brothers and my sisters all over this land. On this day, on this day in this generation, in this time and in this place, we join our voices with those who came before us. We join our voices for those who have gone unheard. We raise our voices, naming our truths and our hurts. We join our voices in hope, in proclaiming our dreams. We join our voices with people all around the world, hoping to end racism, to end sexism, homophobia, ending poverty, disease, and setting prisoners free. We join our voices with Jesus, with Jesus. For the Lord has sent us to proclaim good news. The Lord has anointed us to proclaim grace. So we will build up the ancient ruins. We will raise up the former devastations. We will repair the ruined cities. We will heal the devastation of many generations. Or as common and legend said it, Selma is now for every man, woman, and child. Even Jesus got his crown in front of a crowd. They marched with a torch. Now we've got to run with it now. Never look back. We have done gone hundreds of miles. From dark roads he rose to become a hero. Facing the league of justice, his power was the people. Enemy is lethal. A king became regal. Saw the face of Jim Crow under a bald eagle. The biggest weapon is to stay peaceful. We sing. Our music is the cuts that we bleed through. Somewhere in the dream, we had an epiphany. Now we right the wrongs of history. No one can win the war individually. It takes the wisdom of the elders and the young people's energy. Welcome to the story we call victory. The coming of the Lord, my eyes have seen the glory. Welcome to the story, to the song we call glory. So until Jesus comes again, until Jesus comes again, we will dream our dreams. We will sing our songs. We will share our hopes and our hurts so that all God's people, so that all God's people might know they are part of the song. So that all God's people might know they are part of the song. That they can sing their pain and name their truth. And we will make sure they are heard. We will sing our hopes and our dreams. And we'll make sure all people are part of it. So that all God's people might know that they are part of the song until he comes again.